Welcome to worship at First Baptist Church on this Sunday after Easter. We're glad that you have joined with us. And we hope that you would go to the comments section on our Facebook page and let us know who you are and where you are and how many people are with you. We just like to touch base with those that come uh, and join us through our Facebook Live broadcast. We also hope that you will understand that even though you're not here with us, we can worship our Lord together. And you worship by singing, and so we're going to have lots of good music today. And so we hope that you will join with us in singing the songs. You'll see uh, them on the screen. And so join with us as we sing. Also, uh, when we come to pray, this is your opportunity to talk to God personally. Pray for yourself, pray for your family, pray for those needs that are around you. Another thing that you can do is when we come to study God's Word, if you'll open your Bible, whether it's your leather bound or your back lid, we hope you will be looking at Genesis chapter 17 today. And so we hope that you will study God's Word with us. Also, when we come to the first song after the message, I hope that you'll get your, your uh, go to our church website or the church app and you would give. Giving is a part of worship and we want you to participate with us. And there's one last thing. If you'll look at the uh, upper part of our screen, there's a, a link. And if you're new to First Baptist Church, would like to find out more about us, uh, we'd like to con communicate with you this week. If you'll just click on that and fill out some basic information, we'll be back with you sometime this week. Thank you for joining with us today. Father, we're in your presence. And we want you to speak to us through the music, through the sermon. Lord, we want you not only to speak to us, but we want to hear you. And we want to obey what you ask us to do, that we would be transformed. And we pray it in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Glad, we, glad you're with us this morning. You know, when, when you come to church, as maybe most people do, they, they find that favorite, that favorite pew, or in, in our case, that favorite chair, and they, they like to sit there because that's where they feel comfortable. And if somebody comes and sits in your place, then that just kind of maybe throws your day off a little bit. Well, maybe now that, that you guys have been worshiping at home for these past five weeks, um, maybe you found that, that favorite place on the sofa, or you found that favorite chair, or maybe even that, that favorite place on the floor. We want you to find that place this morning, and we want, you to, we want you to make yourself at home in the worship. You know, the psalmist, the psalmist writes that God is at home. God inhabits the praises of His people. God is at home in our worship and in our praise. So we want God to feel at home in our worship. So wherever you are, we want you, want you to be engaged in worship. So let's sing.
Thank you, John, praise team, and uh, instrumentalist. We're so glad to have them because they really make worship happen here at First Baptist Church. Uh, we want to welcome you. Uh, I want to begin by telling you about uh, someone that I, I've seen but I've never met. 
Uh, she was born in 1892 in Harlem, the Netherlands. Her name was Corrie, Corrie Ten Boom. Uh, Corrie was uh, the daughter of a Dutch watchmaker. She learned the trade, uh, came through the Depression, and in 1940, the Netherlands was invaded by the Nazis. And as you know, the, the uh, persecution, not only of just the normal people, but particularly the Jews, uh, was overwhelming, the Holocaust. Uh, and so the Ten Boom family became very attached to protecting these Jewish refugees. And so they created a little room behind a false wall uh, in Corey's bedroom. And they could ha house about six people at a time. Over the period of four years, they took in over 800 Jewish refugees to keep them from falling into Nazi hands. One day in 1944, a Nazi informant turned in the Ten Boom family. Uh, the authorities came in. Uh, they took them all, arrested them all, uh, and then sent them, scattered them to various places. Corey and her sister were sent to the Ravensbrück concentration camp in Germany. And she was there for uh, uh, about six months, and in December of 1944, her sister died. Twelve days later, unmistakably, it was, it was unbelievable, Corey was released probably because of a clerical error. And so from that time on, Corey knew that God had a plan. You see, uh, that she had always trusted God while they were taking care of the refugees. She really had to trust God when she was in the concentration camp. But she learned that's the way God wants us to live our lives. She wrote a book, actually wrote several books, one of which was The Hiding Place. The Billy Graham Association made a movie uh, called The Hiding Place that uh, I saw and was really overwhelmed by how God used this one family to save the lives of so many people. Her wisdom, her godliness, her faith, her trust in the Lord really came out. She made some statements that, in her writings that really have just captivated my attention. One of those was, uh, worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow, but it robs today of its strength. Another thing she said was, if you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. But if you look to Jesus, you'll find rest. And you know, that really speaks to us in times like this. Not distressed, not depressed, but looking to Jesus where we can find rest. And then one thing that really kind of is the, one of the focal points of the message today is she made a statement. I've used it many times, but it's never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. In a similar way, where these are times of high stress, high anxiety, discouragement, many people are dealing with depression. How do you deal with that? Who do you trust in times like this? Do you trust the media? Do you trust the, the government and, and, and the leadership of our government? Do you trust even the medical professionals? Because there's so many difference, differences of opinion about what's the best way forward. Who do you trust? I think we need to go back to what Corey Ten Boom said. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future. And certainly we're in an unknown future. To a known God. The problem with people is that we know a lot about God. But we really don't know God. Because if we know him, then times like these are not going to overwhelm us. They're not going to fill us with fear. They're not going to discourage or depress us. It will cause us to trust him more. 
And the reason why some people can't trust him now is because they don't know him. So I thought it would be appropriate for us as, as a church, as Christians, to really know more about this God that we say we need to trust. As you read the scriptures, one of the ways God is known is through the understanding of the names by which he calls himself. As a matter of fact, in the scripture, there are probably a hundred plus biblical names that identify who God is. Now, we have to understand, in biblical times, a name was more than just a person identifier. It actually pointed to the person's character, to their nature, to their behavior. Let me give you an example. Noah, the, the, his name means rest or comfort. And it was a reminder that Noah found rest from destruction in the ark. Jacob, the name means supplanter or trickster. And we see that in Jacob's life. He, he tricked his brother. He tricked his father. And he was tricked himself by Laban when he went to look for a wife. Joseph means may God add. And God certainly added blessings through this young man's life, not just to his own family, but even to the nation of Israel. Moses, it means to be drawn out. And where did Moses come from? He was drawn out of the water by Pharaoh's daughter. That's how he got the name. Throughout the Old Testament, we see different names for God. We see the name Elohim, which is that there are a true, only God. We see that uh, found 25 times in the first chapter or two of Genesis. We see Yahweh. That's that eternal and personal name. We see Yahweh Nisi, which is God, is our banner of victory. Yahweh Rophe, which is our healing God. Yahweh Shalom, which God is our peace. And so over the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at the names of God, not just for a theoretical or theological study, but so that you and I can know Him better. And the better we know God, the better we can trust Him. We really need to trust him in times like this. We begin our study not with uh, the most common name for God or even the second most common name for God. We're going to use a name that is found in Genesis chapter 17. Uh, you've heard the story of Abram. He was called by God in Genesis chapter 12, and he left uh, Ur of the Chaldees, which is now modern-day Iran, the city of Babylon. And he moved to uh, uh, what is modern-day Turkey and then came down to the Promised Land. Uh, and there he sojourned and lived for 24 years. Now, when God called him, he made him three promises. The first one is, I'm going to give you a son. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a, a heritage. Number two, I'm going to give you a land. And number three, I'm going to make you a blessing. And so for 24 years, Abram was faithful to God. And nothing happened. Nothing happened. And so you might imagine if you and I had been given a promise from God and nothing happened, we would be a little anxious, a little concerned. And Abram from time to time tried to take matters into his own hands as we do. But then he said, okay. In Genesis chapter 17, God appeared to him. God spoke to him, and this is what he said. Now, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer will your name be Abram, it shall be Abraham, for I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. And I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come forth from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you 
and to your descendants after you. And I will give you and your descendants after you the land of your sojourning, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. I will be God Almighty. The word, the name of God that is used here is the word El Shaddai. Now, if you've been around for a long time, uh, you remember uh, Michael Card wrote a song in 1981. Amy Grant made it popular called El Shaddai. Uh, that's the first time many of you ever spoke Hebrew. Uh, but it, it, was, it was a wonderful, still is a wonderful song. But that name, El Shaddai, comes right out of this passage in Genesis chapter 17. It's more than just a song, though. What does it mean to us and how we can get to know God? Well, the first thing that we need to understand is that, uh, that God is our power. Too many Christians have a weak view of God. Their understanding of who he is and what he's about uh, is so limited, not because God doesn't want to show us, but because we haven't investigated it. There are other Christians that have a view of a weak God, that he is there, but he really can't do much for my circumstances. This word El Shaddai literally can mean strong and powerful. God is powerful for you and me in the circumstances that we find ourselves. He has power to keep his promises. That's what it says in, in verse 2. I will confirm my covenants to you. God had made this promise to Abraham 24 years earlier, and still it had not come to pass. But God reminds Abraham here, I don't care how long ago I told you, if I told you, it's going to happen. And when God tells you something, it's going to happen. Hard days, lack of progress, fretful feelings, all of those do not deny God's promises. And El Shaddai is a reminder that God keeps his promises to us. And we see that played out over and over in Scripture. It's another thing because it, God's power can overcome obstacles. He says in verse 6, I will make you fruitful. Well, you have to understand at this time, Abram is, a, is 99 years old. His wife, Sarah, is 89 years old. Not a great time to be starting a family, is it? It's just something that you think that, that is physically impossible. But when God revealed himself to Abram, he said, I don't care how old you are or how old your wife is. I'm going to do what I promised that I will do. I will overcome any obstacle you can, you can say, well, you know, God, look how old we are. doesn't matter. When God says he has the power to do something, he can overcome any obstacle. Mary found that out in Luke chapter 1 when God announced that she would bring forth the Messiah. She, she said, for God, nothing is impossible. Mary was certainly a demonstration of that. So he can keep his promises, he can overcome obstacles, he can even deal with enemies. It says in verse 8 that the whole land of Canaan, where you're now an alien, I will give it to you as an everlasting possession. Now, Abram was one man who had a family and a small band of people with him. There were all kinds of aggressors in the land. He was old. There, was, there were all kinds of limitations to his ability. And yet God said, no, I'm going to give what I promised to you to give. Genesis chapter 15, just a couple of pages earlier, God demonstrated that promise. He said, I'm going to come through. And he, he gave him a vision, and there was a sacrifice, and there was a declaration that this land is yours. It's not going to be yours yet, but it's going to be yours. And 430 years later, it became the land of Abram's descendants. So, God is powerful. We need a powerful God for times like this. Many of you are tired, you're scared, you're frustrated, you're anxious. Maybe you've lost a job or at least your income has been cut back. 
Maybe you're worried about how are we going to make ends meet. And though you've heard countless commercials on television from all of these companies that say, together we're going to get through this, not a single one of them has knocked on your door and delivered a giant pack of toilet paper. And so you're wondering, God, are you powerful enough to meet my needs here? And the Scripture says, yes. God says, when you know me, you'll understand that I'm powerful. In Genesis chapter 18, God says again to Abram, is anything too difficult for the Lord? 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 33, for who is God except the Lord? Who but our God is a solid rock, a strong fortress. He makes my way complete. Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. But God made the earth by his power. He preserves it with his wisdom. In his own understanding, he stretched out the heavens. He speaks in the thunder. The heavens roar with rain. He causes the clouds to rise up over the earth. He sends lightning with the rain and releases the wind from its storehouses. So when you hear the rumbling of thunder that's going on right around us now, you know God is powerful. And then Jesus summed it up in Matthew 28, 18. He said, all power is given to me both in heaven and on earth. And when you know El Shaddai, you know that God is powerful. So where do you need his power in your life right now? The second thing. El Shaddai means God is my protector. Literally, it can be translated, El Shaddai means the God of the mountains or God Almighty. You know, every time I go to the mountains, there's, there's a feeling of awe and majesty, but there's also a feeling of security. I know to, to date, at least in recorded history, there's not been a hurricane to touch the Rocky Mountains. Not many tornadoes come through uh, southwest Colorado and the San Juans. The mountains are rock solid and unmoving and unshakable. And that's the picture of who El Shaddai is, God who is our protector. He protects us from fear. How often do the Psalms say, God is our refuge, our fortress, our tower, our rock. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. He's the protector of the weak and the weary. He's the protector of the widow and the orphan. He's the protector of the fearful and the faltering. Isaiah chapter 25 says it this way, You have been a refuge for the poor, a refuge for the needy in their distress, a shelter from the rain, and a shade from the heat. God's there for your fears right now. He's also a protector from our failures Psalm 121, verse 3 says, He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Guess what? We're going to make mistakes in life. We're not going to do everything right. We're going to have problems. We're going to, we're going to goof up. And sometimes our failure is our fault. Sometimes the failure belongs to someone else. But yet God will not allow our foot to slip. God will not allow our failure. This is a truth that I want you to write it down. God takes personal responsibility to those people that are willing to live to give their life choices to him. God's not going to let you fail. There may be temporary delays or detours, but there'll be no permanent failures. He's also our protector, not just from fear and failure, but also from falling away. Jude chapter 1, verses 24 and 25 say, Now to him who is able to keep you from falling. In times of difficulty, sometimes we think about, is God really good in all of this? Or, or, or do I have the courage and the strength to, to go on with him? Some people in times of tragedy, they turn and walk away from God. But God said, I am strong enough for you to keep you from falling away. We have security for our future because our security is not in ourselves. 
It's in Him. Where do you need that protection today? Fear? Failure? Falling away? Third thing that we see in this passage, El Shaddai means God is my provider. It's interesting because uh, the term can be used literally breasted, that God is all-sufficient like a nursing mother calms the hunger and the fretful restlessness of a baby. God provides everything that we need, blessings, assurance, strength, direction, encouragement, calm, finances, peace, all of that. God provides for us. He provides for our physical needs. We see that in Matthew chapter 6 where Jesus said, consider the birds of the air, consider the lilies of the field. And then he goes on to say, are you not worth much more than they? That God will provide all of your needs. If we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all of those things will be added to us. God provides grace for the weak. Second Corinthians chapter 12 said, when Paul prayed about that thorn in the flesh, he said, God, how, how can I deal with it? And he said, Paul, let me tell you, my grace is sufficient for you. And because my grace is sufficient for you, therefore don't be discouraged, don't be fretful, don't be anxious about what you don't have. Because my grace is all that you need. He provides for our physical needs. He provides for our psychological needs. One of the greatest struggles people are having now is when and how do we finally get back to normal? Some are depressed because they've been isolated for so long and they miss that physical contact. Particularly, I've, I've seen that in our senior adults. They just want to be around their friends and family. Other people are fearful of coming back because what if that virus is lurking out there and I don't know if I want to go back. Well, the time is coming when this virus pandemic will begin to subside and we will be faced with a choice. Do we ever go back? And how do we go back? When do we go back? And those are tangible things that can be addressed by medical people, by cleaning, and by other kinds of things. But so many of those issues are psychological needs. I don't know if I can trust my kids to go back to church. I don't know that I can trust going back out in public without a mask and gloves. God is there for those kinds of issues as well. God's presence not only calms our fears, but He answers our doubts and our discouragements, our anxiety and our uncertainty. Jeremiah said it well. We talked about this a few weeks ago. He will keep him in perfect peace whose mind, whose heart, whose life is fixed on Him. He provides physically, psychologically, and also spiritually. This pandemic is a spiritual journey as well. God didn't cause it, but God knew it was coming. God was not surprised when this pandemic hit our world. And so for many people, this has been a real spiritual struggle for courage and for strength and for wisdom and for assurance. Paul said it well in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, And my God shall supply all of your needs according to, in proportion to, His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Maybe God is doing something in you in this season. 
to remind you of coming back to the right priorities in life. Things were going along, the economy was booming, everything was great, and your priorities were all out of whack. And suddenly, you've discovered in this season of sequester, wait a minute. And that's a spiritual journey that God wants to take you on. For some of you, your schedule was so busy, you didn't have time for God. Your weekends were caught up, you didn't have time to come to church. And all of a sudden, this pandemic has made you realize my schedule controlled me instead of me controlling my schedule. And I need to come back to the way things ought to be not the way things were. Maybe some of you during this pandemic have realized that there, is, there was within me a spiritual void. That it's not that I didn't know about God. It's not that I wasn't a believer. It's just that there was no depth because there was no discovery of who God is on a regular basis. And now, in this time, you've realized, I don't have the spiritual resources because I didn't have any reserves. And you've come back to read your Bible, to pray more in these uh, few days that we have been sequestered than you have maybe in the past year. And maybe some of you have discovered that there are resources that God has for you that He didn't know that were available. And in this time of study and prayer and Zoom uh, connection, Bible, Bible studies, uh, listening to online worship services, maybe you've discovered some resources that you didn't know you had or that you needed. And if you haven't discovered those things, if you haven't discovered the spiritual side of this, maybe when you understand that God is El Shaddai, he is the provider. Even in the midst of pandemic for your spiritual life, that's what we're here today for. How can you know this God who is all-sufficient, who is all-powerful, who is almighty, who is the one who has power, who has protection, who has provision for you and me as we go through this time. How do we discover it? Well, look back at verse 1. I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. The first one is a recognition that God alone is Almighty. Not you. We, we, man, we have discovered that. Science isn't enough, medicine isn't enough, government isn't enough. Only God is almighty. The second thing is walk before me, build relationship with me. The word before me literally is a, is a, is a phrase that means face to face with me. You know, where our, our relationship with God one time was it distant or in passing. Now this is nose to nose. This is face to face. And God says, that's what I've wanted all along. Walk before me and be blameless. Now, he's not talking here about perfection. He's talking here about wholehearted commitment and obedience. And maybe during this time of pandemic, you need to see El Shaddai brand new. You need to know who he is and discover more of who He is so that you can have a relationship with Him that is up close and personal and that you can do that with a whole heart of commitment. And when you do, then Almighty God is there for you. Where do you need His power? Where do you need His protection? Where do you need His provision? If there's anything that we as a church can do to help you, please contact us. That's what the, 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 the link is in the upper part of your page. There's some need that you have, some understanding that you need. We'll be glad to contact you this week. Would you join me as we pray together? 
God Almighty, we thank you for who you are. God, so often we forget in the busyness of our life, in the struggles of our life, even in the, the fears of our life, we forget who you are. Lord, you are almighty. You have power for every circumstance that we face. You have protection for every difficulty that is ours. And that, God, you provide whatever we need just at the moment that we need it. So, Lord, I pray that these people that have listened in with us will discover it, follow it. In Jesus' name, amen.
you.